Hi, my name is Gabriel Weymouth. This is Didi, and we're going to be going over the first of the Jupyter Notebooks on this introduction to numerical Python for engineers, which is Python Basics. Again, you can either just click on this link on the GitHub site, or you can download everything and run it uh, on your own computer, as I have here. So the first thing is to get familiar with notebooks. So if you haven't seen a notebook before, there are two types of cells. So you can go through and change those types. On the Jupyter, kind of when you've downloaded it on your own machine, you'll be able to look at which one it is through this little bar here. And you can see that there's options for code and markdown and then some other ones we're not going to use. But a markdown cell is meant for kind of annotating what's going on, telling a story. You can put in equations, links, pictures, things like that. Um, the Python cells will be labeled as code. And you can run those Python cells by clicking the play button here or here or uh, hitting shift enter, which is what I'll tend to do. Um, and so in this case, we've run that code and you can tell it's run because the numbers changed and there's an output. Um, so that's what we're doing. If we run it again, we can get something else. So in this case, I've got my name is Gabriel, but we could do my first and last name as well. So hello world, my name is GD Weymouth. And this is a, you know your standard intro example, but I've made it a little bit more interesting because I've assigned a variable here I've used an operator, which is this plus symbol, to add some different strings together into one big string. And then I've put that all in a function, which is print, which prints out this result. So we've already seen now these ideas of variables, operators, and functions. And that's all we're gonna do today. We're just going to build up our understanding of that until we can start looking at some engineering examples. Okay, so let's start with the variables. So Python, unlike some languages, you don't have to tell it what the types are. It'll try to figure that out by itself being dynamically typed. So in this example, I've set A, B, and C all equal to five, but three different fives. So this one should be an integer because there's no dot afterward. This one is a string of letters, and you can see that I've told it that by adding the single quotes around it. And then the last one has got a float because of the point that comes after the five. And I can check to make sure what kind of types these are by using the type function in Python. So the type of A is an integer, the type of B is a string, and the type of C is a float, as desired. Okay? And we also see that we get this kind of output afterward. We didn't get an output from this notebook cell because all we did were assignments. You kind of have to leave something at the bottom and then it'll assume you want to print that out. So that's what I've done here now, all right? Also notice every time I run a cell, it kind of increments this. And that's important to remember. If you don't run a cell, Python hasn't seen it. So if I were to try to run this one before this one, then it wouldn't know what A, B, and C were, despite the fact it was kind of above. So these aren't run chronologically. There are kind of new notebook versions, uh, which make that a little bit easier. But in this standard Python notebook, that's going to be up to you. So you have to be careful about running all of the cells in the order you want them evaluated. All right, now that we have some variables, we can think about operators. The operators should be things you've seen before almost entirely. Very simple, like addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. And then there's a couple that are a little different or unusual. There's floor division. So that's when you take one number divided by another and then you drop the remainder. There's modulus, which is take one number divided by the other and only keep the remainder. And then there's exponentiation, which is nothing new, a to the power b. But notice the symbol is two of the stars next to each other. So a single star is multiplication and double is an exponentiation. Okay, so that's it. It's not that tricky, um, but let's get some practice at it. So here I've written down a set of these basic operators on some numbers and other things. And I want you to look at these and start thinking about what you think Python's going to do. One of the best ways to learn is to anticipate answers, to guess what's going to happen, and then quiz yourself. 
So you need to test and check. So instead of just running this, I want you to go through mentally and try to decide what's going to happen on each one of these lines, and then hit the print button. If you want, you could break these all up into their own little cell blocks, uh, and you could do that just by splitting. So this is an option to split cells. So then I could just run one at a time. For the purposes of this, I'm going to go through them all at once so that the video doesn't take forever. Um, so this one should be pretty easy. Four times five should give us 20, and indeed it does. So please go through the rest of these and try to imagine what the result's going to be, and then go through those results and find out where you still have some issues with this operators. All right, so let's do it real quick. Four times five again, but now with floats. And the return is another float. So that's something to think about. If I multiply high, the string, times five, I don't get a high five. Unfortunately, I get five highs. Uh, they're kind of multiplied together. I get more of the same thing. Uh, but that's a kind of a weird way of doing multiplication, a little bit surprising. So keep an eye out for that. Um, divided by five divided by four gives me 1.25 either way I do it. So integers or floats, either way I have to get back a float because this isn't an integer number, 1.25. So that's necessary. If I want an integer back and I want that to be certain, I need to use that floor division so that I drop the remainder and that just gives me one, okay? And then last but not least, we've got five divided by two times two. And this gives me the answer that you probably think it should. Five divided by two times two is five because I've divided by two and then I've multiplied by two again. If what I meant was five divided by four, then you need to use parentheses. Uh, so this is a mistake that happens a lot. Make sure that you put things together in parentheses if you want them to be evaluated together. And last, let's do a little modulus four, modulus five. Well, four doesn't go into five at all, any number of times, so the remainder is four. And five divided by four goes once with a remainder of one. So that's our modulus. Okay, nice and easy, just warming up. Now we get into the meat of the matter. So functions are really important. I think they're the basic building blocks of numerical methods in Python. Uh, the reason why is that you can organize different operations getting kind of more and more complex. You need to put those together and then you can test them and verify that they work, validate them against some cases. And that bit of code then can be used over and over again without worrying about copy paste errors or anything else. So writing and testing functions is the easiest way to write code and also the least error prone. So I definitely think you need to get a handle on functions. So let's look through it. Um, so first, we need to look at the syntax. We can see that def is this keyword and it's kind of bolded here. And that's just standing for define, for define a function. Then we've written the word multiply, that's gonna be our function name. And again, syntax wise or kind of highlighting wise, we've got this now blue automatically, we got blue. If I switch so that it doesn't say def anymore, we lose all that fancy highlighting. Uh, so that's very handy. And then the next part is the arguments. So we have an argument list enclosed in parentheses. These are the things that the function is going to depend on. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. And then that's followed by a colon. So that tells Python that we're done with the definition of the title and the arguments. Then we have the body of the function. So here we're just going to multiply the two numbers together to get a new number C, and then we'll return that number. So if we use this function, the value C will be the result of evaluating that function. Okay, so that's it. And now, that's all very simple. Let's try it out. Multiply three by four, error. Multiply is not defined. Ah, remember, we need to do these things in order. Yeah, I did that one on purpose. Uh, so you have to evaluate multiply before you use it. Um, so in practice, it's very convenient to put as much of these things together in one code block so you don't get caught. I've broken them up here 
because I want to explain things as I go. Having a really big code block and then a big bunch of text wouldn't be very good for education, right? But when you're writing your own code, it's usually better to put it all together in one block so that you can avoid that kind of thing. Now let's look at the result. Multiply three times four, get 12, looks good. Multiply six times four, get 24. All right, looks pretty good. I'm happy with that function. Now let's talk a little bit about those arguments again in more detail. In my opinion, the most common mistake when people define functions is by having stuff inside the body of the function which wasn't passed in as an argument. Everything going on in the function needs to come in as an argument. If you don't, you're just inviting confusion, okay? Here's an example. So here's a very bad function. I'm multiplying, but I've only passed in b. Now here's return a plus b. Maybe you think this will give us an error. Unfortunately, even worse than an error, it tries to do it. So Python goes through and says, I don't know what a is. There's no a in the local scope. It hasn't been passed in as an argument. So it goes looking for an a. And it's hard to say where this a even came from. And it turns out if I scroll all the way back to a few minutes ago, there's the a. It found an A, and so it tried to use that value, even though that's not what we wanted. Um, if that is what we wanted, instead of doing this, we should do something like times five. And then we can define a constant, A equals five. And now, at least we'll have nice repeatable behavior that's not randomly doing anything it wants. Whereas the way I had it written before, if we had changed the value of A, we'd get completely different results out. So be really careful that anything you use in a function is passed in as an argument or defined inside the function. Nothing outside should come inside, okay? That's it. I think that's a big tip and it'll help a lot. There's one more thing about functions that you may have noticed, which is that they've got this kind of indentation thing going on. That turns out to be really important. So let's try this function. It's another slightly less trivial one where we're going to double and then add. So we double A and then we take two A and we add B, okay? Ah, but it doesn't work. And this time we do get an error and it's at least helpfully named. It says indentation error. We were expecting an indented block. And that's important because Python needs to know where the function ends. So for example, in this code cell, maybe it would think that double then add is part of the function. The way that Python divides sections of codes together, that it knows this is the body of this function is by this indentation. So adding a tab tells it this is where we're starting. And as soon as something comes out of that level of indentation, then we know that it stopped. So in other languages, there are things like curly braces that go around functions, and but in Python, it's just indentation. So you do have to be careful about that. So 10 double is 20 plus 12. Yes, that looks pretty good. Two doubled is four plus 12 is 16. Yeah, all right. So it looks like this function now works. No error messages. Good. Another place where we have indentation that takes on an important meaning is in loops. So this is a for loop. So we've got four i in range five. So, and then inside this indentation block, we've got print high and the value of i. Let's see what happens. So what we can see happened is that we've printed high five times when this range is five. We also see that the value of i starts at zero and then increments five times, okay? And that indeed is what always happens when you have range. So range is a function in Python, a convenience function, which sets up this kind of incremented list. It starts at zero by default, and it increments up the number of spaces that you've given it. So if I change this to six, then I'll get six of these highs instead. Notice that means that i never reaches the value six, right? Because I started at zero and I incremented six times. Um, so that's something to be careful about. There 
are other options though. So range starts at zero by default, like I said, and it also increments by one by default, but we can also give it additional arguments. And what we can see here is that we get, when I pass range three, 11, two, I start at three, I go up by a step of two each time, and then I go up to, but not including 11 just like I went up to, but not including six here. So that's the format for range. We can always get more information on a function that we don't know by using a question mark. So if I wanna know more about range, because I'm not familiar with it, all you need to do is say question mark range, and that will pop up this little help dialog. And we can see here that there are kind of two forms of the range function. In one, you just give it the stop. and In the other, you give it start, stop, and optionally, that's what these square brackets mean, you can give it the step. Uh, and that's it. And by reading through this carefully, you can see uh, some key information, like the fact that the stop is omitted, like we said, up to but not including the stop. All right, so that's a nice example. And of course, there's also the option of doing this more than once. So that's called a nested loop or a nested function. We can define a loop inside another loop. So in this case, let's see what we get. We've cycled i through a range of three and j through a range of three, and then we printed i j. So we get all of the zeros for i and j is being incremented. All of the ones for i, j incremented, and twos and j incremented, okay? Another thing to notice is that this print statement is within the i loop, meaning that it happens every time i is incremented, but it's not inside the j loop. And again, that's just because of the indentation. So with a tab, now I get it every time, okay? So that indentation really is important. It doesn't care, Python doesn't care about this inter because you wanna be able to have blocks of code inside functions and loops that are separated, but the indentation does matter. So that's why people say that white space is important in Python. Okay, that's it. And again, if you ever need help with a function, then you can use this question mark. There's also a syntax where you can do help, and then that itself is a function, and you can type a function name in there. All right, very good. So that's it. Those are just the things I wanted to talk about in this first lesson, those three simple things of variables, operators, and functions. We also threw in some loops for good measure. So let's do a couple physical engineering examples now. So the first one is a classic example of a spring mass system. So we have a spring, we have some mass and some spring stiffness. And we know from basic physics that the natural frequency of this spring squared is equal to the stiffness of the spring divided by the mass that's on the end, okay? This is our natural formula for the natural frequency. So as your first exercise, if you are given omega n is two radians per second and k is 31 newtons per meter, then what must be the mass, okay? So I want you to solve this equation for m. So replace this in terms of, with some formula in terms of k and omega n. So for instance, maybe it's k squared. I evaluate this one and now I've loaded this variable mass with a value. And you can test that with this next cell. It did not work. So here we can see that I should have gotten a mass of 7.75. I don't even know what the mass was that I got. I can test it. I certainly didn't get 7.75, uh, but what I've set up here is just a little assert call. And that's a good thing to know how to do. It's a function check, making sure your output matches what you think it should. When you change this formula to be the right formula, then you'll be able to get the right mass and this print statement will happen and it'll just say correct instead of throwing this error. The second exercise is a fluid force problem. So a lot of times, in engineering, we'll have to think about fluid loads. So let's say we have a foil, and that foil 
is being towed or flying on an airplane or whatever with some speed u through a fluid with a density rho. So these are kind of the environmental and variables here. Then the foil itself has some area a and based on its shape we can get a drag coefficient cd of that thing. And that's it. Now we can figure out the drag. The formula is written down here. Drag equals one half rho u squared times the drag coefficient and times the area. Okay? So as long as we know these other things, we should always be able to determine the drag. So that's all you need to do. But what I want you to do is just fill in the function for this thing. So it's just another exercise of practicing variables and operators. Make sure I have all the things I need here and then fill in the function. For your third one, I want you to loop through a set of speeds. So say we were doing a set of experiments. I don't want to just do some random speed. So here I've picked some random value for the velocity. I want this particular set of speeds starting at two meters per second, then four meters per second, and so on until you get to 16. Okay, so in that case, we'll just use the range function and the loop and we'll go through and all I want you to do in this first one is print those values of u. So that'll be pretty easy to check yourself to see if you got it right. And the last one is we're going to combine those two things together. So we have a function for the drag and now we have this range of values that we're going to run experiments at. I want you to predict the drag at all of those speeds given a drag coefficient of 0 0.1, an area of 0.2 meters squared, and a density of 1,000 kilograms per meters cubed. Just to help you check your answer, that final result, the highest speed, should be 2,560 newtons. Okay, as a little bonus, you can use the function round to make sure to round the answer that you print to screen so that you have just whole numbers of Newtons. And if you don't know how to use the round function, then we know how to get that information, right? Because now we know how to use help. Good luck.